You guys might recognize this guy. He used to work on campus for nine years as the managing editor of the Biola magazine, and he was Dr. Corey's speechwriter, right? So, you know, Dr. Corey, when he sounds good, it's actually him, okay? Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, that's why his speeches have. No, it's, it's not. No, don't, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. I want to work here, okay? Uh, <laughs> and then um, he is also an. El he's now. The senior, a senior editor at the Gospel Coalition, and he is an elder at his church, Southlands in Brea. That's right, that's right. And uh, he just wrote his third book. It's called Uncomfortable. We're going to be talking about this today. It's about the church and the importance of community in our lives. Help me welcome Brett McCracken. All right, so Brett. Hey, so why did you want to write this book? You've written a lot of other books, but this one doesn't feel like necessarily in your... Why did you want to write this book? Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of things. I think, uh, one, I think the church, the local church is more important than ever. I think yeah. it's more countercultural than ever yeah. in our world, which is so digital and disembodied, and we can live our lives kind of apart from physical community. Yeah. And I think we're losing the ability in our culture to know what it's like to be together with people who are different from us and have conversations and learn to love them even amidst their differences. Yeah. The local church is a place where that happens or should happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's more important than ever for us, our society, but even for us individually in our Christian lives, it's so hard to grow in our faith as individuals, just isolated, doing our own kind of you know, unique individual spiritual path. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. easier when you're in the context of community. Absolutely. So I wrote this really to challenge Christians to lean into the local church, even though it's uncomfortable and awkward at Absolutely. Times. You know, one thing is here at Biola, it seems like we have a lot of community. Mm -hmm. It seems like there is a lot of discomfort sometimes. But what does a church give that Biola cannot give? Mm -hmm. I think one thing is uh, longevity, more than four years. Yeah. So I've seen it a lot when Christian college students, and I went to Wheaton College, which is similar to Biola, um, you, you have this really strong Christian community for four years, but if you don't kind of make the local church a priority during those four years, then when you leave and it's not a priority, then no long, you no longer have Christian community and it, it all kind of falls apart. And I've seen that happen and it's very sad. Yeah. So a local church ideally is your kind of long-term Christian community. Mm. And it's, it's more than just people who are your similar age group. That's the other thing right. that the local church offers. You know, Biola, you do have professors and there are some kind of intergenerational, there's various forms of diversity and that's great. Mm -hmm. But the local church I think has a more kind of, kind of concentrated microcosm of um, the diversity that is the Christian church. Yeah. yeah. You know, in the beginning of your book, you say something like, um, and I'm going to paraphrase, so sorry if I get it wrong, but it's something like, what we want in a church is not necessarily what we need in a church. Yeah. Can you unpack that for us? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I was responding to with this book is just consumerism and how, how much that infiltrates the way we think about everything, yeah. including the way we think about church. And a consumer society that we live in basically says, like, Every, every decision you make should be about what's best for me. How does it fit me? Does this, does this fit me in my preferences or not? And so we've, we've now applied that to the way we look at churches. And so we church shop, we use that term That's church right. shopping, right. which is problematic. I think that we're adopting the language of consumerism for mm -hmm. how we go about searching for a church. So we, we look at church like, okay, what is, how does it fit me in my needs? How does it meet me where I'm at? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the wrong question to ask. Mm -hmm. I think we need to ask, is this church meeting Jesus where he's at? Mm -hmm. And if it is, that's a church I want to be a part of. It's mm -hmm. not about how it fits me. It's about how this church fits the model of what the Bible lays out for what the church should be. Absolutely. You know, is there something wrong with certain language terms and that shapes our ideas? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, yeah. church shopping or even maybe I'm a member of a church rather than part of the mission of the church. Like, mm -hmm. how, how can we clean up some of the language and what might mm -hmm. some of the language cleanups be? Yeah, yeah there's, and there's a lot to say with that. Um, I think, like I've already mentioned, I think the language of consumerism is problematic, so I, I think we should not talk about church shopping anymore. Yeah. Um, I think we often talk in individualistic terms, which mm. is part of this problem. We talk a lot about my personal relationship and how's your personal walk. And I think part of that is good because that there's truth there. But the reality of the church, the reality of what the Holy Spirit is doing and forming this people is it's plural. We need to start using the terms of like, um, I'm part of something bigger than me. And again, con our, our consumeristic 
Western individualistic culture really puts the emphasis on me. Yeah. You know, and the iPhone, the, the iPod, the little I that is attached to everything yeah. is just one example of how this world is all about me increasingly. And we can kind of opt in to the media that we want. We can create our Netflix lists just tailored perfectly to me. Yeah. And so the church needs to push back against that and we need yeah. to look at the church as something that is bigger than me. Yeah. And it's not just about meeting me and my unique yeah. journey. Well, can I push back again a little bit? And sure. so consumerism has actually helped the church a little bit. It's helped us think through what are the market needs of my community? How yeah. can I help uh, serve the needs of, of, of the people around me? Like, why do we have to be aware of that? And mm -hmm. why do we have to push mm -hmm. back against that kind of consumerism? Yeah. Yeah, I talk a lot in the book about the seeker-sensitive movement, which was a big thing in the last 30 years of Christianity in America. Basically, it was about adopting kind of the principles of business and consumerism to think about the audience as consumers and what are their needs, how can we meet them in those, you know, let's do surveys about the type of coffee they like, the type right. of sermons, the type of music. And I, I, I kind of critique that a lot, mm -hmm. but I do think that we have to be careful that we don't throw that out completely in the sense that we do need to be aware of the culture around us. We do need to be aware of the unique questions that people are asking, um, the unique um, just issues they're struggling with, and we can't just like be deaf to that. Yeah. We have to have a listening ear to people. The problem is when we cater everything we do to that, yeah. and we kind of, we forget about the gospel and Jesus and the Bible and we're focused entirely on the felt needs of mm. our particular congregation or the people that we want to attract. Yeah. Um, so it's got to be a both and, but I think sometimes the seeker-sensitive movement has put the emphasis too much on uh, what are the needs people have out there and how can we yeah. address those. It's kind of like we want to bring people in, but we're not yeah. focusing on actually developing exactly. good people or good totally. disciples. Okay, right. cool. Yep. So I'm going to ask you a little personally, okay, and there are yeah. some South Sense people right here. Yeah. What makes you uncomfortable about your church? Right. Yeah, I mean, my, my journey at Southlands the last five years has inspired this book in some ways. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a church that's very different than churches I grew up in. Um, in this book, I, I start out describing in great detail my dream church. If mm. I could paint the picture of the perfect church for me, what would that look like? And I had a lot of fun, like, going into great detail, yeah. but then I say, like, my current church is actually nothing like my dream church. It looks <laughs> very different, uh, and it's everything from, like, the, the music style wouldn't be my preference. The, there's a lot of charismatic things going on, which mm -hmm. I, it was so out of my comfort zone. Right. I grew up basically thinking that was weird. Mm -hmm. Even holding your hands up in worship was something, you know, 20 years ago I would have never done. I, I would have thought that was strange, Completely. and now I'm like, you know, hands up all the time yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, worship yeah. at church. So it, but my experience has been I've grown so much by being uncomfortable. So that's the thing. Mm. Like in anything in life, you don't grow by staying in your comfort zone, right? Like right. whether it's a sport you're trying to improve in or a skill of some sort, you, know, you don't grow in your comfort. You grow by being stretched outside of your comfort zone. The same is true for our spiritual lives. And I've experienced that the last couple of years at Southlands. I think yeah. I've grown a lot. Yeah. My wife and I both. Yeah. And so it inspired me to write this book to really challenge other people to do that. Like, find a church that isn't the most comfortable fit for you. Mm. Find a church where there's some things about it that are going to be stretching, that mm -hmm. are going to be challenging. Yeah. And I think you'll find that that's ultimately going to be good for you. Okay. So how do you find the right balance between comfort and mm -hmm. discomfort mm -hmm. as you're looking for a church? And as we try to find, and again, you know, we have students here coming from all over the world, mm -hmm. and then we have students who are about to leave Biola. How do we find a good church that has yeah. enough of what I need and what also like, might make me uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to be, you don't want to go to a church that's just like all discomfort all the time, you hate it, like yeah. you're just like begrudgingly sitting there throughout the whole service. Yeah. That's obviously not good. Like you want to have, you want to be in a community that you love yeah. or that you can learn to love. Yeah. And ultimately you want to be in a community where you, you grow. And so I think growth is the key kind of thing to look for mm. when you're considering what's good discomfort. Yeah. Um, so. If you look at a church and you know it's going to be uncomfortable for this and that reason, but you see the people in that church are growing, you see signs of that, mm -hmm. you see signs of transformation, then I would say that's the good discomfort. Mm -hmm. They are growing through, through discomfort for them, and I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's discomfort that just leaves you bitter, 
all the time, mm -hmm. and it's it, you know it becomes kind of an abusive environment mm -hmm. in some way where it's just toxic, mm -hmm. and obviously that's not a good environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, healthy discomfort is about growth ultimately. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, we're gonna call a timeout here. All right, Brett, and we're gonna invite our worship team to lead us in a reflection, and we're gonna ask you guys to text in questions, the social media in questions, and then we're gonna answer your guys' questions right after this reflection. So again, we're gonna call timeout, and can you guys lead us in a reflection? All right, Brett, so we're gonna jump into some of our questions from our audience, and here's our first question. It says, how do you differentiate what you need in a church rather than what you want mm -hmm. in a church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when you think about like what's my list I'm looking for in a church, yeah. um, the, the wants are usually more like the tailored to me and my tastes, like my, yeah. my preferred music style, my preferred like architectural style. Yeah. Um, you know, the aesthetics, like all those things. The like coffee. The yeah. coffee, like, so those are wants. Yeah. Like, those are nice to have. Right. Um, the needs are the things that I think um, all people, all, all, all people everywhere need. Like, mm. we need a relationship with God. We need to grow. We mm -hmm. need the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we need a community that um, knows us and can sharpen us mm -hmm. and push us to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kind of the essentials, I would say. Those yeah. are what we need in a community. Great, great. Great. Yeah. Here's another question for us. No, that's, oh, okay, here we go. Wow. What happens, okay, if you want to grow one way, so you go to one church for a season, but then you want to grow in a different way, which your current church can't accommodate? Hmm. Is it okay to leave your current church for a different one? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would say if you ever stop growing like in a church and you just kind of fall kind of into this status quo yeah. over a long period of time, um, that's probably not a good church to be in. Mm. So maybe that does warrant looking for a new church. But I would kind of question, I would ask the question like, in what way are you kind of determining that you need to grow in one way and you need to switch that? Because I think those decisions, those considerations need to be made in community. Yeah. Um, again, like individualism kind of makes it all about me and what, what I think is good for me. Mm -hmm. But one of the beautiful things about community is it's not just you determining yeah. that. Like you have all these people who know you and who are mirrors who can point out things in you that you can't even see yourself. Right. So I would process that with other people in the community mm -hmm. and be like, where do you think I need to grow? Yeah. And if that's not happening in that church, then that's one thing. Yeah. But I would, I would be quick to hear what others say and slower to just determine it for myself. Yeah. Well, can I ask you kind of a personal question again? Yeah. You said you've been at, at Southlands for about five years now. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to say where you were before, but what mm -hmm. made you leave that church and look yeah. for something, and how did you decide to land at yeah. Southlands? Uh, it was really just a practical thing. Okay. I was, yeah, it was a church that was like um, an hour drive mm -hmm. away in downtown LA. Mm -hmm. And and I was getting engaged uh, to Kira, mm -hmm. who also works here at Biola, and she was going to a different church. So mm -hmm. we were both going to different churches. Got it. It was one of those things where we just wanted to start fresh okay. somewhere. Cool. All right, here's another question. Do you have any practical tips of finding a church that has the right balance of discomfort and comfort? Mm. Practical tips. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think there's like a, an easy kind of prescriptive solution to that question. I would just say, like I said before, like um, look for one or a couple areas in a church where you, you can identify that's going to be an area of discomfort for me. Yeah. And it's going to be an area that stretches me. Maybe it's the style of music that just is not your favorite. Maybe it's that it's a very diverse community intergenerationally. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more older people than you've been in before, yeah. and that is gonna stretch you in some ways. Um, I was talking to a, a friend who I've kind of mentored, uh, he's a Biola grad, and he's in a life group now at our church that's yeah. like mostly like 70 year olds, okay. and then him in his 20s, and he's <laughs> like, oh, this is so uncomfortable, like I don't wanna stay in this group. Yeah. And I, I just challenged him a bit, and I just pushed him like, maybe you could see this as an opportunity to grow in mm -hmm. ways that are not going to be easy and it's going to be super uncomfortable. Yeah. But I also gave him the caveat, like if you know, the weeks go by and it's just terrible and you aren't, it's just not a healthy thing, then that's one thing. Yeah. But give it a shot. Like, you know, it's counterintuitive in our consumeristic culture, which right. says the minute it becomes uncomfortable, you have the right to leave. Mm -hmm. But I think Christianity calls us 
into the discomfort. It's where faith built around a cross. Mm. And Jesus says, take up your cross. Like, yeah. there is sacrifice that's at core to this faith. Yeah. And if we're not willing to make those sacrifices in the way we go about Christian community, then we're not living into what Jesus calls us to. Yeah, that's good, that's good. All right, here's another, tr- here's another question from Sam. And she asks, by the way, Sam writes our, bio, our blogs after every one of these, and if you want to check it out, check out our webpage. So Sam, she asks, what about out-of-state international students where the local church community will be lost after returning home post-grad? Yeah, it's really, really good practical question. I mean, I would say still, when you're here in this season, become plugged in to a local church, and you know, you're gonna bless that community so much by the perspective that you bring from your context, out-of-state or international, and that's the thing that I want Bible students to remember about church attendance. It's not just about what you're getting out of it. Yeah. You are giving. Like yeah. Your presence in a church is blessing the other people there in amazing ways. And un- the consumeristic thing makes us think that it's all about what I get out of it. But mm-hmm. we forget that just being there gives so much. We bless mm. others. So I would say to this person, like, just find a church here in this area while you're a student and embrace the beauty of the fact that Christianity is global and that yeah. in this season here, you're a part of this part of the body and then you move back home and you're part of that part of the body, but we're all part of the body of Christ. You know, we're united. Yeah, So yeah, have a bigger picture of the body of Christ and yeah. we might participate right. a certain way here. Great, right. love that. Okay, here's another question. What if your church environment is currently toxic in the sense that there isn't any growth and ministry is treated like a job. But you don't wanna leave because you wanna see a change in that culture, even if it makes you bitter and people are against your efforts. Stay or leave. A lot of people wanna stay or leave their church right now. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and I don't wanna make it seem like it's an easy decision. And that we Absolutely, should, we this, should, is a, this is a good question. This is here. a really good question, yeah. yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is trying to change a church culture or taking that upon yourself isn't always a fruitful endeavor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you can, you, sh- you can find small ways to kind of broach the topic of an area that you could see growth, mm-hmm. but um, don't kind of brand yourself as like the, the person who's, who's like always complaining about everything and ne- needs to change everything. Right. I would start with small things like, and have conversations with the leadership in the church and go about it in a hospitable, humble way, mm-hmm. and not in a way where you're kind of this know-it-all who's yeah. like got the answer and is correcting the way that the church is doing yeah. things. Um, but yeah, try to have conversations, see if there's any movement, see if there's any growth. Yeah. But if there isn't, and there, you know, it just becomes this toxic environment where it's not changing, yeah. you want it to change, then I would say find another church because that's not a good environment yeah. to be in. Yeah. It, because again, that's making it about you. Yeah. It's about what you want to see this church change, and that's another form of consumerism. It's another form of individualism. Yeah, it's, and the change doesn't happen right away, right? Yeah. And, it's, and I like what you said, it's humility and not coming in as, oh, I'm from the Bible Institute. I know what we need to fix, right? Right, right. Okay, cool. All right, here's <laughs> another question for us. Okay, what are some ways we can focus on growing as a church rather than simply as individuals? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, just being in church is a big thing. So attend on Sundays, be part of like small groups, um, and just start thinking about it in, in plural terms. Mm. Like think about decisions you make in, in terms of community. Um, so don't just like look to community to validate the decisions that you've already made as an individual, mm-hmm. but actually like go first to your community and process decisions with them. Yeah. Um, and, and don't have this kind of low bar of commitment either. I think part of growing as a church plural is all of us need to have a stronger sense if we're committed to one another. Yeah. And we're not just gonna leave if like a job opportunity happens in another state and I'm just gonna abandon my community or right. a, a cool church opens down the street that my buddy goes to, so I'm just gonna bail. Right. Like we need to have stronger senses of commitment. Yeah. And I just wanna say like millennials, of which I am a millennial, we're not great on commitment, mm. right? We're the FOMO generation, like we're, yeah. there's so many options that we're hesitant to commit to one thing because we might miss out on other things. And that doesn't really work with our spiritual lives. Like you can't grow much if you you kind of go to a church for a year or two, but then you go to another church and you go there for a couple years and then you float around from church to church. You're Mm -hmm. never gonna grow long, like in the long term. So 
we need to have a, a sense of I'm committed here for the long haul. Yeah. And that's gonna, you're gonna see fruit and growth yeah. in community. And the more of us in community who do that, the yeah. stronger the growth will be. Yeah, I love that. And I wanna push back just a little bit because I'm from more of a collectivistic culture. Yeah. And in that, it's all about the community and yeah. then not about the self. Right. And so I think for me in my journey, there was actually a process to actually think mm -hmm. that I'm important mm -hmm. in this culture. Mm -hmm. And so for me to, th to, to go and say, hey, I need to find who I am in Christ, but then also balance that yeah. with the community too. Yeah, again, so, there's a balance, there's a both and to absolutely. this. And I think part of the discomfort that I talk about in the book is the discomfort of nuance and complexity. Mm -hmm. We're not a culture that does well with that. Mm -hmm. like, the news, everything you see on the internet is so extreme, mm -hmm. and there's not this sense of, well, maybe it's a little bit of both and. So that's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable place to be, and, and yet, as Christians, we need to have more of a threshold for the discomfort of, of both and in, in this area, among others. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Both and nuances, all the gray areas. Man, that's right. hard. The it's gray, hard for our culture. Gray matters, after all. There you go. That's the second book. Okay, here we go. What, uh, how do I differentiate between church shopping and a spirit-driven search for the church that God has chosen for me? Hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's an, an interesting question, and it's kind of what I've been talking about. I think church shopping is more about me and my particularity, my unique needs, and yeah. it's about how does this church meet me where I'm at. I think a spirit-driven church, A, you're gonna feel a conviction, mm. like you're gonna feel the spirit prompting, and I think it's more about looking at what the spirit is doing in this church. Like, mm -hmm. apart from me, and apart from how it lands on me and my uniqueness, is there, are there compelling things that the Spirit of God is doing in this community? Yeah. Um, are people growing? Is there transformation happening? Is Jesus the center? You know, is, is the gospel the center? Is Jesus Christ the hero of every sermon, of every song? Yeah. Um, pay attention to those things, and I think yeah. that's, where, that's a spirit-led search for a church rather right. than my laundry list of checklist items that right. I would want. And just to, just to be clear, there's a lot of these kind of churches around here, right? Yes. There's a lot of these right. churches that are totally. doing the right things. It's not just right. like we're looking for that one perfect right. church because there's no right. such thing. Yeah, right? one of the things I say in this book is, and it's kind of an extreme statement meant to be provocative, but I say yeah. like, you know, really we should just find the nearest non-heretical church <laughs> like, and go there and like try to like make it work. Like, and it's, yeah, it's obviously more complex than that, but mm -hmm. in some ways it isn't. Like, for centuries in Christianity, people did just go to the church in their community. Like, you did just go to the nearest right. parish. Like, there was never a question of, like, oh, driving 20 minutes away to find that church that fits me. Mm -hmm. That's a very new innovation in a consumeristic culture, and we forget that because we're so used to that. But for most of Christian history, people just did church in the community that they found themselves in geographically. Right. right. Great, okay. Here's another question. How should a church's theology and or political alignment factor in picking a church that is uncomfortable in a healthy way? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously theology is a big, big thing. So I wouldn't recommend uh, going to a church that is theologically off the rails and, yeah. and you know that's the type of discomfort that I want like bad theology like no like yeah. that's not healthy discomfort <laughs> um, or you know politics is uh, we live in such a politicized moment yep. and and I wouldn't choose a church that's like overly political one way or the other right. because I'm on the other end of the spectrum and I'm just going to be in, uncomfortable like I don't think that's a healthy form of discomfort either mm -hmm. um, having said that I think a church that like engages political topics, not from a partisan point of view, um, but you know, a church that has like a bunch of Republicans, a bunch of Democrats, and everyone in between, I think that's actually a healthy discomfort that can happen mm -hmm. um, in a church like that. When it's all one or the other, and you're you know, the other, then I wouldn't recommend kind of taking up that challenge right. for whatever reason. You know, I don't think that would be good. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, here's another question. You mentioned local church diversity, yet I notice most churches, especially around here, have little to no diversity. Ouch. Yeah. How do you think is the best way to combat this as people tend to aggregate in a, to a community with people that think, look mm -hmm. like they do? Orange County. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is definitely something that I challenge the church in this book about. I have a chapter on uncomfortable diversity. 
And it's true, like we're, we're really bad at this in Orange County, in America in general. And I, I think it is the whole consumeristic thing. Like yeah. um, we, we choose people who are like-minded um, because that's an easier thing. Mm -hmm. that, that's a form of choosing comfortable Christianity is choosing to go to, to go to church with people who think like me, look like me, believe like me, are never gonna like push back on anything I say or do. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not the vision of the gospel. That's not what, uh, if you look at the New Testament, it's all about Christianity is this revolutionary thing that breaks down the walls. Like all the walls that we divide over in our culture, gender, ethnicity, class, whatever, mm -hmm. so much of the New Testament is like, Paul, you know, and the other apostles just like railing against that and right. saying like, no, you need to, you need to do everything you can to model something different, right. something united. And so it's really a shame that a lot of our churches today don't take up that uncomfortable challenge, but right. man, do we ever need it? We need it in our culture because the church, again, by, by its very nature, it models something countercultural. It models people coming together for a couple hours once a week to listen to a sermon, to sing out loud together, to like take bread and juice, and to do all these weird things <laughs> that it, there's no paradigm for it in our culture increasingly. Right. So we have this opportunity to model countercultural things, and one of those is doing life, loving one another amidst our differences mm. and our diversity. Mm. I imagine Democrat, Republican saying, we're gonna love each other still. Yeah, right. Like that's, that seems mind blowing mm. to me in our culture right now. Absolutely, yeah. and what a witness that can be. Absolutely. And what a attractive thing in a culture that is weary from disunity and polarized partisanship. Right. If the church can model a loving, welcoming environment where the Democrat and the Republican break bread together yeah. and have civil conversations and every other form of diversity, what a, a beautiful picture of heaven. That, and that's the church being the eschatological entity that it is, right? Mm, the church mm. of Jesus Christ is a bridge between the now and the not yet. That's what we're meant to be. Right. We're meant to be this sign of heaven yeah. now. Yeah. And it's, it's imperfect and we're not that great at it, but yeah. there's, there's opportunity there and the spirit wants to do that yeah. in us as the church. So good, I love that, I love that. We're a symbol of hope for this world. Yeah, exactly. Love that. Great. Uh, I got to read your book. Oh, it came out six days oh, ago. Awesome. Wow. Okay. Good, good I got to read your book. You say holiness is more authentic than brokenness. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. A lot of tweetable quotes in here, by the way. I read it, so it's really good, too. Can you unpack that for us? Yeah. Yeah, so I talked about that in uh, chapter um, two, which is uncomfortable holiness. Um, and yeah, what I'm talking about is we live in this culture that privileges authenticity. And that's yeah. the chief value. And, yeah. and oftentimes that's code for our brokenness. Like authenticity is just like our, how we're messed up in all these ways. And that's just my authentic self. And don't tell me I need to change. That, yeah. This is authentic to me. Yeah. And unfortunately that has infiltrated the church. And I see a lot of Christians who have adopted this mindset mm. where we're more compelled by our authentic brokenness and that's, that's the currency of solidarity in our small groups. We just kind of go around and share, how are you broken, how are you broken, mm -hmm. and, and that's authentic. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is actually, the, more, the most authentic person who ever lived was Jesus Christ. Mm. He's our model for authenticity. He's the most authentic human. Yeah. And so if we're wanting to be authentic, being broken is inauthentic. That's, that's what we are by the fall. That's a warped, perverted, human form. Yeah. The more authentic is the Jesus-like holiness. So as we move towards that, we're becoming more authentic. Yeah. And so the church needs to be a place that isn't just kind of patting each other on the back for how broken we are, but is pushing us together yeah. towards growth. It doesn't yeah, mean we're not honest and vulnerable right. with our brokenness. We do need to be honest, but we all we can't stay there. We can't just be satisfied with that. We need to be sharpening us, each other, pushing each other forward yeah. in growth. No, I love that. Our, our, our goal as a church is not to celebrate our brokenness, right. but to celebrate the growth that we have and right. the potential we have to grow in Christ. Right. Love totally. that. Cool. Well, Brett, you know, as we close, we ask this to every one of our Bilauer guests, and we say, what are some of the biblical principles mm. that helped shape your ideas for today? Yeah. Um, I think First Peter uh, chapter 2 is, is kind of the, the text that I really... Uh, was inspired by, and that's the text where Peter talks about the church a lot, and he talks about it as like, you are a holy nation, you're a royal priesthood, yeah. you, are, you are this unique people, you are set apart. Yeah. Once you were not a people, now you are a people. Yeah. And then he has this great image of, you are living stones being 
formed together as a spiritual house. Mm. And I just think we lose the sense of the majesty of the church, like this thing that we, are, we get to be a part of. Mm -hmm. It's such a privilege, and uh, it, when we're to be set apart, and that's uncomfortable, it's mm -hmm. the whole holiness thing, mm -hmm. to be different from the world is not comfortable. Yeah. And increasingly, I think, in American culture, it's gonna be less comfortable mm -hmm. to be a Christian. We're gonna be seen as more weird, Completely. more strange, Completely. and yet we're part of this eternal entity the church will outlive the universe, C.S. Lewis says. Like, mm -hmm. everything will pass away, the church will be around. And That's right. It's an eternal entity. Yeah. And so we need to not be ashamed of that and not try to, like, you know, um, just view that as this thing I don't want to be a part of because the world says it's weird, it's strange. Uh, we need to embrace it as strange as it is, as uncomfortable as it is, because mm -hmm. these are the people we're going to be with in heaven forever. Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Awesome, awesome. Hey, let's thank Brett for being here with us today. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.